Hi everyone and welcome back to my YouTube channel. This video is titled The Dillinger Gang in Texas. John Dillinger is probably one of the best known depression desperados of the 1930s. We know that the Dillinger Gang being mostly infamous in the Midwestern states, mainly in Illinois, Minnesota. Although Dillinger's career lasted only about 14 months, he was credited with robbing over 20 banks and four police stations. Dillinger had one of the shortest criminal careers of all of the Depression desperados. During the early 1930s, banks in the Midwest were among the most successful in the nation. Dillinger was satisfied with robbing these banks due to their vaults being full of cash. But what about Texas? Why would Dillinger need anything in Texas? Well, the correct answer is guns. This video is about how two unsuspecting men in Texas supplied the Dillinger gang with powerful weapons that outgunned even the federal agents at the time. The incident that brought these two Texas men and their deeds to the spotlight of federal lawmen and prosecutors was the murder of a San Antonio, Texas city detective. But first, let's briefly review the criminal career of John Dillinger and why he is still remembered today. During the Great Depression and the Prohibition era, this nation saw the development of a new breed of outlaw, spiritual descendants of Jesse James and Billy the Kid. People woke up every morning to read the headlines of Pretty Boy Floyd, Babyface Nelson, Machine Gun Kelly, Bonnie and Clyde, and of course, John Dillinger and his gang of bank robbers. All of the Depression-era gangsters, Dillinger has to be one that is most remembered today. Although Dillinger had one of the shortest periods of crimes of most gangsters, he is still known throughout this country and the world. During his stay at the Illinois State Prison, which was his first prison term for armed robbery of a grocery store, he met several hardened criminals that would take the young Dillinger under their guidance. He would be released in 1933 and swear vengeance on society. Just a month after being paroled, he would use his skills that he learned in prison to rob his first bank. Receiving $10,000 from this first bank, Dillinger knew this was the way he wanted to make a living by robbing banks. Dillinger and members of his gang were well known to the public, especially for the high number of robbing banks throughout the Midwest. One of the first sensational events that highlighted the Dillinger gang was the thrilling arrest of Dillinger and several gang members in Tucson, Arizona. Along with Dillinger, Charlie Mackley, Russell Clark, and Harry Pierpoint were arrested. This arrest and his transportation to the Lake County Jail in Crown Point, Indiana was the most photographed event in Dillinger's criminal career. He was transported to Crown Point for the murder of a policeman during a bank robbery in East Chicago, Indiana. Dillinger's escape from the Lake County Jail with the sheriff's car was just as sensational and also propelled him into the national spotlight. As soon as he could, Dillinger restarted his bank robbing career, including jail escapes and robbing police stations of weapons and bulletproof vests. In the public's eye, Dillinger was probably the most successful bank robber of the time, although gangsters such as John Harvey Bailey had a much longer career and gathered more money from the banks than Dillinger. Still, he was lesser known. The next sensational event for Dillinger was the Little Bohemia shootout with federal agents. In April 1934, federal agents received a tip that the Dillinger gang was hiding at a hunting resort in Wisconsin. A sensational gun battle occurred at the lodge, resulting in a innocent man being killed by federal agents. 
Dillinger and his gang escaped from the federal ambush. Eventually, an additional series of events led to Dillinger being ambushed at the Biograph Theater on July 22, 1934. Of course, headlines across the nation covered the shooting of Dillinger. The death of Dillinger did not stop the headlines. Other gangsters replaced Dillinger's name in the daily headlines. The exploits of Dillinger and his gang members and their use of some very powerful weapons led to the investigation of who and where did they obtain these weapons. In December 1933, the killing of a San Antonio police detective accelerated these investigations. By December 1933, Henry Carrington Perot had been employed with the San Antonio, Texas Police Department for 15 years. Perot was born on February 18, 1877 in Nelson, Virginia. In 1933, he was tall, slender, and 56 years old. He lived at 419 Caton Avenue with his wife, Mamie. Perot had seen a lot of activity during his 15 years in San Antonio, he advanced to a criminal detective on the police force. However, on December 11, 1933, Perot would meet a very dangerous gangster and get caught in a situation that would shock the entire city. On December 11, 1933, Detective Perot received a tip that a Chicago gangster would be traveling to San Antonio to meet up with a woman. Pro with officers Alfred Hartman and Lee Jones, were watching the house where the woman reportedly lived. The officers were watching for a car with Illinois tags since it was driven by a Chicago gangster. However, they noticed a taxi that stopped in front of the house. A woman matching the description given to the officers ran out of the front door of the house and jumped into the taxi. The officers noticed a man inside of the taxi. The taxi sped off from the house traveling east on Commerce with the officers trailing fast behind. The taxi had to stop at a traffic light. The gangster inside of the taxi knew he was being followed by officers, so he jumped out of the taxi and started running east on Commerce from Water Street. The officers started to run after the gangster. The gangster, who was unfamiliar with the area, ran into a dead-end alley in the 400 block of East Commerce. Realizing he was at a dead end, the gangster pulled two automatic pistols from under his coat and started firing at the officers. The officer in front chasing the gangster was Hartman, who drew his pistol from the holster and went into the alley. The gangster fired at Hartman, hitting the hand holding the, his service revolver. Hartman's only choice was to find cover from the gangster's flying bullets. Next, at the corner of the alley, Perot, armed with a shotgun, began firing toward the gangster. The gangster turned his attention toward Perot, firing multiple shots, hitting Perot in the head. Perot instantly fell to the ground. The gangster then started firing at Jones. Bullets started penetrating Jones's coat. Realizing that he was outgunned, Jones became so nervous that he fainted. On December 23rd, Jones would be suspended for failure to show the proper energy in attempting to capture the Chicago gangster. He would be exonerated and return to work in January 1934. Then the gangster ran out of the blind alley and jumped onto the running board of a passing car. Unable to hold on, the gangster then ran to a truck that was stopped, forcing the driver to take him away from the bloody scene. Onlookers of the shooting took the injured officers to the nearest hospital. Perot was the most seriously injured with a bullet wound to the head. Detective Perot died at the hospital on December 13th. Perot's death shocked the city of San Antonio. Dignitaries and police officers from around the state attended Perot's funeral on December 14th. He was given a hero send-off 
Perot was buried in the San Fernando Cemetery No. 3 in San Antonio. The other wounded officers all recovered from their gunshot wounds. However, Perot's funeral did not stop the citywide manhunt for the killer gangster. Federal agents, including the well-known Gus T. Jones, were called in to assist city police investigators. Critical information was gathered from the woman that was with the gangster. She would later admit to being his wife. Immediately after the gun battle, officers received word that there was a total of five Chicago gangsters in town. One of the gangsters was located in the fashionable Aurora apartment building located at 509 Howard Street. The gangster was identified as H.L. Keith, also known as Charles W. Fisher, and was carrying $1,400 in cash and an automatic pistol the same caliber as the gun that was used in the shootout. The gangster was not identified as one in the gun battle, but he was wanted for several post office robberies in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Under interrogation, the woman stated that the man in the taxi with her was her husband. However, she gave a few different names for her husband. She did tell investigators that she believed her husband's real name was Tommy Carroll. By the time that Tommy Carroll shot and killed Detective Perot, he was well known as a Dillinger associate. Thomas Leonard Carroll was born on November 28, 1900 in Red Lodge, Montana. Tommy grew up tough and learned to box in his early years. A broken jaw that never healed correctly ended his short-lived boxing career. In his mugshots, you can notice his offset mouth due to this injury. His first time in jail was in 1920. He would continually be in and out of jail for the rest of his life. Carroll joined the Dillinger gang sometime in late 1933 and participated in his first robbery with the gang on October 23, 1933, when he joined Babyface Nelson, Homer Van Meter, John Paul Chase, and Charles Fisher, in the robbery of $32,000 from a bank in Minnesota. On November 11th, he was spotted and pursued by two Minneapolis detectives, but managed to escape. In March 1934, he joined Dillinger, Van Meter, Nelson, John Red Hamilton, and Eddie Green in stealing $49,500 from a bank in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Carroll was assigned to watch the street, and he captured 12 police officers single-handed. Nelson, however, shot and wounded motorcycle officer Hal Keith before they made their getaway back to St. Paul. Carroll was the wheelman a week later when the gang made their biggest score yet. On March 13th, they robbed the first national bank in Mason City, Iowa of $52,344. Dillinger and Hamilton both suffered gunshot wounds when they left the bank and the gang fled to St. Paul. The robbery had attracted so much attention that they couldn't risk staying in the city long and decided to disappear for a while. The gang headed for the Little Bohemia Lodge in Wisconsin a month later. The FBI followed the gang to their hideout and on the night of April 22nd, Melvin Purvis led a raid against the lodge. The raid resulted in disaster, with federal agents killing one civilian from the Mercer CCC camp. Federal agents also wounded two other workers from the same CCC camp. Babyface Nelson killed Agent Carter Baum and wounded Agent J. Newman and local constable Carl Christensen. South of Little Bohemia, all of the gangsters easily escaped. Carroll remained on the run with Dillinger and Van Meter for almost a month. Eventually, he hid out in a cabin outside of East Chicago, Indiana. 
On May 19th, he and the rest of the gang were indicted by a federal grand jury in Madison, Wisconsin, and charged with harboring each other as fugitives. Later that month, as the gang went their separate ways, Carol was reunited with his wife, Jean. Carol and Jean managed to evade the authorities for only a few weeks following their departure from Dillinger. On Wednesday, June 6, 1934, they checked into the Evening Star Tourist Camp, about five miles south of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. The next morning, they drove to Waterloo, Iowa, arriving about 10.30 a.m. They ate breakfast. Then Jean bought a brown dress at 226 East 4th Street, which she put on and wore away from the store. After that, they stopped to purchase gas at a filling station, then headed to a beer parlor shortly after lunch. The filling station attendant had noticed a collection of out-of-state license plates in the back seat of Carol's new bronze-colored Hudson sedan. He called the local police after the couple drove away. The attendant gave the police the make of the car and the license plate number. Detectives Stephen and Walker began cruising about looking for the vehicle without success and returned to the police station when suddenly the car was spotted across the street. Carol had carelessly parked the car across from the Waterloo Police Garage. Officers Stephen and Walker watched a man and a woman come out of the beer parlor and walk to the Hudson. The detectives approached the Hudson sedan As Jean was getting in the car, Officer Walker said to Carol, You're under arrest. The hell I am, answered Carol. Carol reached for his gun in his waistband. Officer Walker, realizing what was happening, knocked Carol in the jaw, knocking him off balance, causing him to drop his gun. Carol then ran into a nearby alley. Stephen and Walker opened fire, shooting five times, with four bullets hitting Carol. Three lodged in his chest, and one pierced his spine. An ambulance was called. En route to the hospital, Carol admitted who he was to the detectives. Officer Stephen attempted to get further information, but Carol stated he had no statements to make. Jean was arrested and sent to the county jail. News reporter Francis Veach was admitted into Carol's room at the St. Francis Hospital. Three doctors were at Carol's bedside. Beach asked Carol if he had anything to say. Carol, who was having problems breathing, stated, I'm hit, buddy. That's all. I'm hit. Beach also asked Carol if he wanted a priest. Thanking him, Carol said the priest had already been in his room. Beach left the hospital and went to the county jail to interview Jean. He asked her if she had a message to take back to Carol. Jean stated, Tell him that I said not to die and that they are going to let me see him in the hospital. Tell him that I love him. He was always good and kind to me and the things they say about him aren't true. We just stopped in Waterloo to get my glasses fixed. Veach told her he would deliver the message. When he arrived back at the hospital, he learned that Carol had died just before he got there, about 6 p.m. He returned to the jail and told Jean that her message had been delivered, thinking it might soften the blow somewhat. Two days after Carol's death, Jean was sentenced to a year and a day for violating her parole. Soon after Carol's death, Jean miscarried their child. Carol was given a Catholic funeral at the Church of the Assumption in St. Paul and was buried in Oakland Cemetery, St. Paul. Due to the tragic gun battle in San Antonio and Carol's association with the Dillinger gang, federal agents soon learned why he was in San Antonio in December 1933. Federal agents soon tracked down two seemingly ordinary shop owners in Texas 
that were supplying the Dillinger gang with some very powerful weapons. The first person that federal agents tracked down was Hyman Saul Lebman, who lived at 418 Fulton Avenue. Lebman's saddle and leather workshop was located at 111 South Flores in San Antonio. While federal agent Gus T. Jones was investigating why Carroll was in San Antonio, Jones was notified that firearms found at the Little Bohemia Lodge that the Dillinger gang left behind was traced to Lebman. In April 1934, Jones and other federal agents raided the saddle shop. At the business, federal agents found numerous rifles, shotguns, pistols, and at least one Thompson submachine gun with its serial number removed. On Ledman's workbench, agents found the makings of Colt 1911 pistols being made into fully automatic machine pistols. A few of the pistols seized belonged to the U.S. Army. Ledman was shown photographs of various members of the Dillinger gang. He identified Homer Van Meter, George Babyface Nelson, and John Red Hamilton all having ordered machine guns from him. During the past few months, he shipped five machine guns to members of the Dillinger gang. Lebman told the federal agents that he purchased several Thompson machine guns from John Stockmeyer in El Paso, Texas. Most of these machine guns were sold to members of the Dillinger gang. Lebman stated that in November 1933, Nelson and other men had Thanksgiving dinner at his house on Fulton Avenue. He also stated that at the time he had no idea that these men were wanted criminals. During the Carroll gun battle investigation, Lebman admitted to federal agents that he does know Carroll, but under a different name. Lebman stated that on December 11, 1933, Carroll came to his house asking for a change of clothing. Lebman helped him with clothing and transportation out of the city. Federal agents determined that Carroll, while running away from the gun battle, came to Lebman's house for help. Lebman helped Carroll, but had no idea that he just had a gun battle with police officers. Lebman completely cooperated with federal agents during the investigation. He admitted supplying the Dillinger gang with over 100 guns. At the time, the Federal Firearm Act of 1934 had not gone into effect. The only federal law that Lebman violated was possession of a stolen firearms from the United States government. The state of Texas did have a law prohibiting possession of a machine gun, so federal prosecutors requested the state of Texas prosecute Lebman on those charges. Lebman was convicted of the state charges. However, a higher court overturned the conviction. Ledman never served any jail time. In 1976, after developing Alzheimer's disease, Ledman retired from gunsmithing and stopped selling firearms, reportedly after pressure from the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Ledman died in 1990, Ledman's son Marvin continued to sell custom leather boots, saddles, and western wear from the Flores Street shop until the shop closed for good in 1995. Hyman Saul Ledman died in September 1990 at the age of 87. He was buried in a Jewish cemetery in San Antonio. All of the Dillinger gang that Ledman dealt with, he liked Babyface Nelson the best as he would later tell family members. Federal investigators eventually recovered all of the machine guns that Ledman had purchased from Stockmeyer. But what about all of the other machine guns, handguns, rifles, and shotguns? Where did he purchase all of them from? Federal agent Gus T. Jones was surprised when he found out 
that these firearms came from a man in Fort Worth, a man that Jones ha just had recently investigated for another crime that made national headlines. In August 1933, federal agent Gus T. Jones led the investigation into the Charles Urschel kidnapping that occurred in Oklahoma City. Eventually, the investigation led to Jacob Clark, business partner in the Wolf and Clark store in Fort Worth, Texas. Jones found out that George Machine Gun Kelly used a Thompson submachine gun in the kidnapping of Urschel that was purchased from Clark. Jacob Clark and Alex Wolf partnered together for a store in Fort Worth. The Wolf and Clark store was a jewelry, pawn, loan, gun, and sporting goods shop. In Fort Worth, the business was located in the 1500 block of Main Street. The building was later demolished in the mid-1960s to make room for the Tarrant County Convention Center. About 1927, Catherine Kelly, Machine Gun Kelly's future wife, moved to Fort Worth with a girlfriend named Esther Louise Magnus. Somehow, they met Clark, probably pawning something for money. On the second floor of the business, Clark rented out a few rooms. He allowed Catherine to stay there until she found work in Fort Worth. Their friendship never ended. She would purchase jewelry and guns from Clark, including the Thompson submachine gun that Kelly would use in the Charles Urschel kidnapping. George Kelly owned several Thompsons and would contact many gun dealers in the area looking to buy more guns. In the kidnapping case, Clark cooperated completely. He testified against George and Catherine Kelly at their trial in Oklahoma City. Clark was never prosecuted for selling Kelly the machine gun. At the time, machine guns were not controlled by federal laws. Then in December 1933, Clark's name came up to Agent Jones once again. Clark admitted knowing and selling guns to Ledman in San Antonio. Clark stated that he had no idea what Ledman was doing with the guns. Clark's defense was that his store was once the largest selling dealer of firearms in the Southwest. He also stated that none of the guns that he sold to Ledman were converted in any way. Jacob died suddenly in 1937. After that, the business was operated by the Wolf family. Alex Wolf died 10 years later in 1947. His son, Toby, would continue with the store after his father passed away. Jacob Clark, being a very religious man, never, never forgave himself. The car family was ashamed of the whole affair. Even to this day, family members will not talk about that part in the family history. Clark is buried in the Wolf Clark Miller section of Greenwood Cemetery in Fort Worth, Texas. At one point, the Dillinger Gang was the most effective and profitable group of bank robbers in American history since the James Younger Gang. John Dillinger was successful in organizing a group of bank robbers like none other. One thing that made the Dillinger Gang so efficient and successful in robbing banks and getting away from the police was the firepower that the gang exhibited, due solely to two Texas contacts that the Dillinger gang maintained, they were able to outgun any force against them. Jacob Clark in Fort Worth and Hyman Ledman each made a good living during their time selling firearms to gangsters. As you can see, Clark's house that he lived in was very luxurious at the time and still is today. Ledman's San Antonio house was more humble, but still nice for the times. Of course, due to the actions of gangsters during the Depression and Prohibition eras, the United States government would create many federal laws against robbing banks and owning certain types of firearms. The National Firearms Act was in, 
enacted on June 26, 1934, less than a month before John Dillinger would be killed by federal agents. By the end of 1934, most of Dillinger's gang would be killed or in jail. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, I enjoy your comments on this topic. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and be sure to hit the notification bell for my upcoming videos. Also, please like and feel free to share any of my videos. Thank you.